Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois, and we have got a great show for you today. Uh, this is like part three, I would say, in like our Good Bad Plants uh, uh, series that we've been doing this fall. And um, But today we're going to be talking about like actually listed invasive species today um, and some of the ways and things we can do to help control them. Uh, and of course, I cannot do this by myself. I am joined, as always, by horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville, Illinois. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris. Are you enjoying the rain? No. <laughs> it's <laughs> we're, we're in that like, I don't mind the cold, but then it's the cold and wet that I'm like, Ugh, you know, and, and we haven't had our killing frost yet there. We have pockets around Macomb that had that killing frost last week. My house, we still got bright green tomatoes. Everything looks beautiful still. Um, so, I mean, the rain's good for those. So, I think, I'm not sure how cold it actually got here. They're calling for freezing, but all of our dahlias and everything still look fine and stuff. So, mm -hmm. we've already pulled our tomatoes out. But if they were still going, it'd still probably look good, too. They'd, they'd be happy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just that, that, that grimy fall time of year. So we got the mop out, you know, for mopping up all the mud that gets tracked into the house, whether it's kids, dogs, or me, uh, it was actually me <laughs> today. So <laughs> didn't realize it. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's just this wet, cold time of year. It's perfect October weather. Beautiful. No sunburns it's, today. No, no sunburns. <laughs> Ken's putting away the sunscreen right now. So, oh yeah, soup weather too. So now I'm hungry. Boy, at the beginning of the show even. Here we go. <laughs> well, Ken, today we are talking about invasive species. And this is like a topic that we have been covering for the last couple of weeks. And we have been talking about species of concern. Now, species of concern, can you remind us, Ken, how we're distinguishing between these uh, different types of plants that we've been covering and, and what's so special about the ones today? So species of concern are, are showing invasive qualities or tendencies, but they're not actually listed as invasive. Um, and invasive is going to be a legal term that you cannot, you know, for our purposes in the state of Illinois, sell um, or buy these plants because they are taking over natural areas or are causing some other kind of ecological harm. And they're not native plants. Should include that too. That is correct. Uh, yes. Um, so, you know, where we've been covering species of concern. So these are plants that you can go buy in a garden center. Today, uh, we talked about burning bush, calorie pear, and then we covered winter creeper and Japanese barberry. So those four plants can go get those at a nursery, but you can also go out to natural areas and see them escaping into those areas. And we talked about those extensively the last couple of weeks. Uh, we can leave links to those in the video description or uh, podcast description below. Uh, we also describe alternatives. So if you want to rip that plant out, what could you plant in its spot? Today's going to be a little bit different because these are listed invasive species. And so um, these are ones that, that can't be sold. So you might not necessarily be looking for alternatives. So well, there's a few that we might mention alternatives, but really we're going to talk about what these plants are and how to control them. So I, I guess with that, Ken... Should we kick off with our first plant? Let's do it. We want to do honeysuckle first. I'd say so. See, let's see lots let's of that start. one. Oh yeah, yes. So we're, we'll we are going to kick the first one off with a moor honeysuckle, and 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 a moor is a species, uh, a specific species. But there's many different types of honeysuckles, and we kind of lump them in as bush honeysuckle. It's like a grouping of different non-native honeysuckle species. Honeysuckle is a woody shrub. Um, Ken, do you recall uh, why this was introduced here into the Midwest originally? No, probably like an ornament. I don't, I don't know for sure, but I would assume an ornamental or like everything else. Or if it, it was soil stabilization or something that's like it. that. That's it. It was soil stabilization. So the like uh, Forest Service extension, all the governmental organizations said, started giving these plants away to landowners and farmers saying, plant this to stabilize your soils. And it, it has become a night, absolute nightmare. Um, also considered it has ornamental value though, and ornamental appeal, because right now 
Uh, Ken, you were going on a walk with the family the other day. You saw a bunch of berries on them. So, I mean, there's an yes. ornamental appeal with these plants. Yeah, we were out at uh, Jim Edgar Panther Creek State Park over in Ashland area. And yeah, walking around there, you know, there's there's all kinds of honeysuckle along the trails. And I mean, it's nice bright red berries and still has green leaves. So it's a nice contrast, nice Christmas looking plant or, or bush. So yeah, it's definitely not one one you want to have around. And and I would say probably the easiest way for identifying this plant is in the early spring or in the late fall, because the way I describe it is to folks is that this plant is not on North American time. It is on kind of a Japanese, Asian, that's where you can find these different species in the, in, in the kind of Asian Pacific area. It's on that time. So it's going to leaf out. It's going to be one of the first uh, understory plants you're going to see in a wooded area leaf out. And it's going to be one of the last ones to drop its leaves in the fall. And, um, and so that, that's, if, if you're really not sure, just wait and, and you will eventually see it. Yeah, it's, I think it's important to point out that we do have native uh, honeysuckle, uh, honeysuckle species mm -hmm. um, as well. So in addition to, you know, leafing out and, and retaining leaves longer, the flowers are going to be a little different. Uh, our invasive ones are white and will turn to yellow and, and pink, whereas our native ones, I think, are more yellow um, year round or when they're when they're out. And then with the invasive species, they're going to have hollow stems. If you break a stem open, it's going to be hollow where our native species are going to have a solid stem. So that's another way if it's, you know, middle of the summer and you're not sure, take off a branch and look to see if it's hollow or not. Mm -hmm. And listeners, you you probably asked this question and Ken and I, we asked this of ourselves just earlier on before the show started. Why are we not doing these series in May during like National Invasive Species Awareness Month? Well, right now is a great time to go out and control a lot of these non-native invasive or species of concern plants, some of the ones we've talked about in previous shows. Um, and so that, that's kind of why we're doing this late in the season, uh, but, but also just those red berries on the bush honeysuckle, they're just popping right now. And uh, I think another reason why folks incorporated them into landscaping was the thought that they are good bird food. Um, I th yeah, I, I think I've done more reading on this, and there are a couple of research articles that actually have analyzed the contents within that berry, and they've shown that it is, it's mostly, um, if I'm getting, I might be getting this a little bit wrong, but it's, it's, it's much fewer, like, starchy carbohydrates, it's a lot of sugar that ferments, and there, I've heard one ornithologist describe after watching birds eat the berries from honeysuckle, they say they 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 fly like they're slightly drunk or inebriated um, because these berries are fermented on the vine. And, but but because they they contain they don't contain much nutritional value for birds. I guess that's kind of the essence of the yeah, that story there. It's junk food. It is. Yeah, it's just like fruit roll ups out there for them. You know, it's not good for them. The bad they, fruit roll up kind, not the fruit leather kind. But they do taste good. They do really do. <laughs> <laughs> I do love fruit roll ups. Oh yeah. Um, so, I mean, Ken, when we go about controlling something like uh, a moor or, or as a larger class bush honeysuckle, the, you know, there's different methods, you know, we could talk about mechanical, we could talk about cultural methods, and we can talk about chemical methods. Um, and I know that there might be some folks listening who say chemical, no, we don't want to use uh, like an herbicide. I mean, that's great. If you have, if the scale of your property is that, that you can do a lot of this mechanically or culturally, I would say do that. But for a lot of land managers, it's, they're managing like acres or square miles even. That's just not practical. They just, it's, they would yeah. need an army of labor, laborers doing this. And there's just not that many people out there that want to do this. So um, it's hard work. Yeah. And it's not a one-time Go pull it and you're done. It's years. So if you're if you're doing hand removal, going back repeatedly, and and pulling stuff out because like we mentioned, birds will eat the berries and birds will deposit those berries, and you will have more popping up. Mm -hmm. 
And and maybe can we need to do a show later on? It's like a, a therapy, kind of like a therapy for those of us that have been managing invasive species for years and years, because you become disheartened because it is it is a constant. You go out and you monitor, you go out and you treat, you go out and you manage these species. And there's comes points where you're just like, why do I do this? Why am I, why do I keep doing this? It's just gonna take over anyway. Why do I spend all my time and effort? On this, and 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 I'll say, uh, you you kind of right. You're it, it's an aggressive plant. It it will invade. It it, it will take over. Um, but kind of the key or the reason why we try to control them and manage them is to at least slow that down because a lot of these invasive species have been introduced at a time scale that's not necessarily the way like uh, natural selection has operated for millions and millions of years. You know, it's a very, we're taking a plant from one side of the planet and immediately moving it to our side of the planet and, and it just takes off. So the idea is to slow it down and allow our ecosystems to adapt or figure out something that might eat it. Uh, so I don't know, Ken, do you have any words of inspiration for our <laughs> listeners or me? Uh, because I become disheartened when I'm battling these things a lot. <laughs> yeah, just say don't give up. I think eventually, you know, if, if if you do a good job of of cleaning it up, you know, you will. I think they have places have seen where that native fauna or flora and fauna will come back mm -hmm. um, if you get this stuff cleaned up. If you have a real bad infestation, and stuff, it just it just takes time, like a lot of other things. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Actually, I've seen folks who are or talk to folks and they're like, "All right, I'm going to control it, but then what do I need to plant in its place?" I'm like, "Well, actually, a lot of that native flora." still there you have dormant seed you might have a few native plant species and they'll fill back in when they're allowed to but um the honeysuckle just just pushes everything out it out competes everything it shades everything out um nothing can grow underneath of it and so it, it's just highly aggressive in that form and also man how many bad things can you say about a plant also here's another thing so it, it, bush honeysuckle kind of has this like arching habit to it so the stems come up and they arch up kind of like a vase shape so our bird species if you're a low under kind of if you're in a low understory canopy nesting bird um, you utilize shrubs or brambles but those are all gone because we planted honeysuckle or we it's escaped everywhere your only option is bush honeysuckle which has a lower branching structure than a lot of our native shrubs actually leaves their nests more open to predation from other mammals or, you know, predators of nests. So um, it can impact other wildlife species uh, negatively. See, and wait, there's more. Yes, there and is. There's, and there's been studies that have been done that show there's more ticks in areas that have uh, honeysuckle. So, mm -hmm. you know, and all the, the problems associated with ticks with disease spread and and all that stuff. So if you, if you need another excuse to get rid of any stuff, well, there's another one for you. We could keep them coming, but folks probably want to hear how to control this plant. Um, so we could, we could kick it off first, I think with like mechanical control and um, Ken remind me what is mechanical control? Like what, what processes is, is, is a, is that in the IPM uh, timeline? So you know, in the case of our, our honeysuckle, they'd be like physically pulling out seedlings or or cutting plants back. Um, things like, and cutting back isn't probably going to do a lot of good. It's going to re-sprout, but it, for our purposes, it's going to be pulling plants out of the ground. Usually seedlings, maybe some of that's a year or two old, but if you have bigger stuff, you're probably moving on to, to something else. Yeah. And, you know, I will... The nice thing about the seedlings is that they are very shallow rooted. And so when I see baby honeysuckle popping out of the ground and I'm walking through the woods, it's very easy to just bend down and pull that right out. And that plant's dead. It's gone. Just throw it over in the side of the pathway and you've taken care of it. Now, in terms of cutting, if you have like a single bush honeysuckle in your yard and, and you don't want to use chemicals um, and but but it's maybe a larger the diameter stem, you can't pull it. You just cut it over and over again. I've often told people that just makes it angry, but it, it would exhaust the root system over 
years. <laughs> and so it wouldn't be as immediate, but uh, you could work on it that way. Um, and another time when I have advocated for the mechanical cutting of like larger plants that you can't um, pull is when the understory is just so thick with honeysuckle, you can't even walk in there. And we have seen that on a couple occasions where it's so thick with honeysuckle, there's no way to do any herbicide treatment or anything. You just have to basically cut it all down. You let the plant re-sprout and then you can treat when the plant's only like ankle or knee high, you know, with like a foliar herbicide. So that's kind of the, the few times where I've advocated for that either pulling or cutting method. Yeah, I think for, for honeysuckle and a lot of these, most of it's going to be chemical, mm -hmm. um, especially for dealing with large areas, like you mentioned earlier. Um, and with that cutting, you, you could do a, something like a cut stump. So cut that, cut that bush back and then paint that stump that's left behind with, um, was it glyphosate's commonly used? I think it's the preferred one for bush honeysuckle. Um, it's a concentrated glyphosate mix, yeah. And what is that concentration? 25 to, let me look at the cheat sheet, 25 to 50% in water. Um, the other option is triclopyr in a 20 to 25% in oil. Um, so, so glyphosate is um, a systemic. You cut it, the bush honeysuckle, paint the stem, and then this, the herbicide goes down into the root system, kills the entire plant. And you paint that on there relatively soon after mm -hmm. cutting. If you wait too long, it'll, it won't move anymore. The plant will yep. kind of seal all that off. And, and it's because of that. I, I normally tell folks it's really a two, maybe three person job when going through a, a kind of a wooded area. You have the person who's cutting. Usually you need to have a second person to, to move the, 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 the uh, debris out of the way. And you have a third person who comes in behind them um, with proper PPE and everything. And they are painting that stump. You can use a foam paintbrush, a paintbrush. Uh, you can use any type of wick applicator. Um, and the other tip here is to put herbicide dye in that mixture so you can, so you know where you've been. And usually within 20 minutes of within cutting, it needs to be treated. Yeah, I did that this weekend, not with honeysuckle, but with mulberry out of a windbreak. Uh huh. <laughs> in my parents yeah. House, so, it, the, and the mulberries are everywhere in my yard too. And we actually have a, a neighbor with a massive, like the biggest mulberry tree I think I've ever seen. And I'm just like, that's fine. It's fine. But I pull in mulberries all the time. <laughs> I don't like to pull out. Not as easy as honeysuckle. No. Yeah. Huh. And and Ken, I, I you might be asking, but Chris, what about fire? Um, can you burn it with fire? Well, you can. Um, so there was some the study done at Hornfield campus. Uh, again, nothing necessarily published because this is more of a demonstration site for WIU students, but they burn their understory with the controlled burn. And they did knock back the honeysuckle, but they didn't kill it. You cannot, it did not kill the honeysuckle because the fire did not get hot enough to kill the root system. If a fire were to get hot enough to kill the root system, that would destroy the woods. And so in terms of a, un, like a wooded controlled burn, at least here in the Midwest, they're very un, uh, uh, they, they're not very uh, glamorous. It's very slow. <laughs> you have to keep lighting the fire over and over again. It's not like the wildfires that we typically see. It's a very cool, slow burning fire, and it just doesn't get hot enough to kill the root system. And so they just resprouted. But it would slow it down. So but it so. would slow it down. Yeah. yeah. Um, and go back to herbicides real quick. Um, I don't know how common this is in, in some parts of the state, but I have heard of people since honeysuckle stays green later than everything else. And when you have wooded areas, like large areas, they will bring in a helicopter or something. Mm -hmm. and spray because everything else has dropped its leaves so you're not you get herbicide on that it's not going to if, to do much if any damage to it but your honeysuckle still has all the leaves so they can go in and bring a hel helicopter or something else in and, and just kind of do a broadcast spray mm -hmm. on that stuff to to knock down really bad 
infestations. Yeah, yeah. And the helicopter gives the most precise applications. In my neck of the woods in McDonough County, there are landowners that go in together to increase that, that square mile area, uh, which drops the cost of the herbicide treatment. And um, it, it works because the case was, Ken mentioned that herbicide only is works on that green living plant tissue. So everything else is dormant, nothing else is affected. Um, and they, I think, I'm not entirely sure, but typically I think they usually use a glyphosate because, because it doesn't have a very good persistence in the environment. It breaks down relatively quickly compared to all the other herbicides that we have access to. So um, it's typically going to be a glyphosate application. Now, all that said, if you have an evergreen windbreak nearby that you <laughs> don't want to have treated, just don't spray uh, the helicopter spray around that because it will kill your any evergreens. So yeah, you gotta have gotta have the right situation to do that. But mm -hmm. that's and I think that, that's something I don't normally hear about is using helicopters to control invasive Becoming species. More common, more common. I would say if you if you have a large tract of land or you have a lot of neighbors with with land and you want to go on on this, helicopters is the more precise targeted way to do it. Um, however. Having been part of an organization that's been trying to do this, we've, it's been taken years because you have to have the weather perfect. It has to be just right. Last two years that our counties tried to do it, hadn't been able to. So this year they're going to try again. Um, but if they, the weather's not right, it just won't happen. Well, Ken, let's say we eradicate bush honeysuckle. Maybe we've had some as it, maybe it escaped into our yard or something, and we've kind of enjoyed it as a shrub. But now after listening to uh, you and I spout off of, about this plant, uh, you want to do something different. Are there alternatives to bush honeysuckle? Yep. So there's there's several. Um, just mentioned the three here. Uh, like, so like I mentioned before, we do have some native uh, honeysuckle species. So one is northern bush honeysuckle. Uh, this is a small shrub. It doesn't get nearly as large as our bush or invasive bush honeysuckles. Those can get six, 10 feet tall. Uh, the northern bush gets about three to four feet tall, three to four feet tall. Like it has those yellow flowers on them um, and it has good fall color. And, and there are cultivars that are available if you wanted to go that route. Uh, coral berry is another one. It's another smaller shrub, two to four feet tall. Greenish yellow flowers that really aren't all that spectacular looking, but that does lead to these nice purple berries, really bright purple berries. Now uh, that'll be on the plants for, and we'll, we'll stay on there throughout the fall and winter and provide that food for birds. And it's not a junk food. So that's, that one's actually good for them. Uh, and the one we've mentioned before, I don't know which plant we this is suggested for, but probably be all of them, uh, winterberry. Mm -hmm. Again, there's a lot of different straight species can be 12 feet tall, all the different cultivars that get two or three feet tall. Uh, so I've, like I mentioned before, I've got uh, berry poppins, which is a smaller uh, cultivar but again it's nice green leaves are in the growing season that will fall it's a deciduous uh, holly and it's got those bright red berries again in the fall if you want those those red berries on a plant and they will also be eaten by birds as well and and, uh, and those are fantastic i want to plant all of those in my landscape and i'm in the woods behind my house so um but moving on to another listed invasive species um, that is is very common in terms of the floral arranging industry is one called oriental bittersweet. Now, this is actually a woody vine. Um, and oriental bittersweet, it uh, the the way it's used in the floral arranging is is it develops these. It's a kind of a bicolored or two toned colored orange red berry, um, and so the it's an orange skin and it opens up to reveal the red uh, uh, fruit inside of it, which is really pretty and looks really nice in a floral arrangement. Um, and so this has been grown ornamentally also as well for, for that same reason, um, but then also just for the floral industry. So this plant has as all the others escaped into natural areas and uh, it can be quite aggressive uh, as I mentioned, it's a woody vine, so it can actually kind of like, uh, you know, what you would think, uh, see a tree root might like wrap around itself and girdle itself. Well, this will do the exact same thing to trees. It'll wrap itself around the trunk, grow way up in the tree, and it, the tree will actually become girdled or strangled. And so uh, Oriental Bittersweet 
has become uh, quite a problem in terms of its invasiveness and, and it, what it can do to uh, a, a tree or a canopy for a wooded area here in the Midwest. Yeah, and those vines can get 60 feet long, basically as tall as the tree they're climbing up. Um, so not only are they, they going to twine around that tree and choke it, but they'll also, you can grow along forest floors and, and similar to honeysuckle, just blanket everything and, and choke everything out as well. And like bush honeysuckle, uh, Oriental bittersweet has a native counterpart. And so we do have American bittersweet. Um, American bittersweet is, uh, it's not as common as like, you know, a lot of the other native woody shrubs that you might, in, or woody vines that you might encounter. Um, but but it is around. It can be difficult to source. Actually, there was a case where I was working with a client. They had purchased from a nursery American bittersweet to plant in their native uh, garden. And when it fruited, it looked like Oriental bittersweet, kind of. It had the qualities of a, both American and Oriental bittersweet. And it was through working with them that we realized these plants are actually hybridizing. So that can happen too. Um, so just be aware of that if you're having troubles determining. But typically Oriental bittersweet, it will develop those, those that fruit within the axles or, uh, you know, I'm, I'm using my hands. So if you're listening to this, you have no idea what I'm doing, but kind of this, this area between my thumb and my palm, that's the leaf axle. If this is the leaf, the fruit develops in that axle right there. Whereas with the American bittersweet, the fruit typically develops on the end of the, the tip of the vine or the, the stem. I think if the American has all red, right? That skin mm -hmm. isn't yellow, it's or orange, it's red. That's correct. As well. Yes. Mm -hmm. So being a vining plant, we can see this plant obviously spreading underground um, via its root system. And so this is one of those that, you know, you just... You, it, it will, as Ken mentioned, it will take over that understory. Um, now, let's say you have Oriental Bittersweet. What can you do to eliminate Oriental Bittersweet in your landscape? Well, uh, in terms of the, the mechanical method, you can pull seedlings, just like with bush honeysuckle. You can do what's called the rope-a-dope method. You can cut it over and over and over again for years and years and eventually exhaust the root system. Um, but that's really difficult. Just keep that in mind. In terms of prescribed fire, actually, it will knock that down and might kill seedlings, but they've actually seen prescribed fire. The plant responds by increasing the girth of its um, its its vine like two to three times. And so you, like again, like bush honeysuckle, a lot of these things just make it mad and just starts growing even more vigorously. Um, now, herbicides are kind of back to that, um, looking at like a glyphosate, cut stump method, we go in with our two or three person team, cutting that and painting that cut stump with an herbicide treatment. And if if you've got it growing on trees, you know, and if you see that, you wanna cut that off those trees and get that off there so you're getting that weight off the tree. Um, and one thing I've I've read about, and, and for Winter Creeper, I did this when he had it growing up our trees, is you cut a section out. So it, instead of just cutting it and leaving it, I cut a big, you know, two or three inch section out so i don't know if it would actually you know you just cut it it would heal back up and, and be able to translocate again but i like cutting a section out just to to make sure just, that just to be sure you, yeah and and i would say the other issue with some of the vining plants whether you're dealing with winter creeper or oriental bittersweet uh or let's add a native and their poison ivy because i think a lot of us deal with poison ivy vining up into some of our plants one method if you're having trouble distinguishing well what is the foliage of my tree or shrub and what is the foliage of this plant is to do what Ken said, cut out a chunk of it and you can let that top growth die. And so anything that's dead and wilted, you can pull that out. Poison ivy, make sure you're protecting yourself. But, you know, other things, um, you know, you just you'll see what's dead. You can pull that out. Um, with woody plants, just be careful because you can damage some of the bark and that vascular tissue behind it uh, when you're removing that. And so just just be careful when doing that. Don't go you know, hulk on the vine and, you know, <laughs> destroy the tree that you're trying to save. Yes. Be gentle. Mm -hmm. So um, Oriental bittersweet is one of those interesting ones, illegal to sell and to grow here in Illinois. However, it's one of those that is still readily available online. 
And so people will purchase Oriental Bittersweet um, fruit online to use in a floral, arra floral arrangement or like a holiday decoration arrangement. And um, what do you do with those when you're done with them, Ken? You just do you, do you properly dispose of them or do you do what most other folks do? Toss them in the backyard and <laughs> toss them in the backyard. There you go. Yeah, it's like, ah, it's for nature. It's for the, I'll let the birds have it. So and then, then they spread. And and I would say in people's defense, I don't know how many people realize what they're getting is is Oriental better sweet and it's invasive. It's probably just, you know, that looks pretty and will do a nice. And you see them in in like fake <clears throat> faux, whatever you want to call it, arrangements and and wreaths and stuff like that. Um, those are on there. So uh, there are non-living options. Yes. Instead of the real deal too. If if you want that orange and red or yellow and red contest. Um so Ken, do we have any good alternatives to Oriental Bittersweet when um we decide that we want to kill these plants? <laughs> I sound so <laughs> evil when I say that. When we want to kill these plants, what do we replace them with? Yes, I don't know how many people actually are planting vines. Yeah. Um, on purpose yeah but i think you know when we talked about winter creeper you know mm -hmm. those those vinings so passion flower that the may pop the native passion flower virginia creeper again that's probably one that people try to to manage depending on how yeah. they feel about it but mm -hmm. those would be two i guess native vining plants that you could potentially look at mm -hmm. i think the here in illinois at least in central and northern illinois that passion flower purple passion flower may pop whatever you want to call it will die back to the ground so if you don't want to worry about that choking off trees or something like that that would be a, a good option well speaking of mail order plants at, as an invasive let's move on to our third one for today and that is teasel now teasel got its name for the the way in which it was used teasing wool so making wool and yarn and stuff like that it, it's very spiky kind of a, like a thistle looking flower head and seed head and so uh it's very bristly and they can use that to tease the wool i don't know what that i don't know what teasing wool is uh i don't, I'm, I don't yeah it's like <laughs> i've read that many times and i've told people that in audiences many times i still don't know what it means to tease wool but i'm sure the wool feels very uh, very sad after all of that has happened and all the teasing that's gone through. <laughs> and yeah, so this one, I, I've noticed it a lot the last couple of years. I don't know if it was just there and I didn't exactly know what it was. Um, we had a meeting up in Northern Illinois, it was up in Lake County and there's a natural area and this was just everywhere. And the person doing the tour pointed it out. And then, you know, now it's, you know, notice everywhere along the interstates, uh, down here in the Jacksonville area and Springfield area, you see it along the roads, these big, the big brown kind of cone seed heads at the top there. And, they, and these things can get what up to seven feet tall. Mm -hmm. So they're, it's, it's another one of those, you know, kind of like your calorie pair and stuff. Once you know what you're looking at and know what to look for, you just kind of see it everywhere. Yep. I think the theory with its spread is that it actually, the seed moves with the wind currents of like large vehicles, like semis, they like the, they're pulling that the seed off of that that head that flower head, and it's just pushing it along roadways because that's I see it all over along roadways too. I think I, I read something that it was you know, a lot of it was out east, and then with the interstate, interstates got put in, then you really mm -hmm. started to see it spread. I mean, there's a problem there, but now with interstates have been around what. 70 80 years yeah now you're really starting to see it spread because of the interstate system mm -hmm. yeah uh, and if you if you want to minimize that spread folks just go like 20 miles per hour down the interstate that's <laughs> wait that's also illegal i think there's a minimum <laughs> speed limit on those things so yeah don't do that yeah you'll get rear ended um in, in terms of uh teasel and control of teasel i know a lot of folks well if it's such a tall plant we'll just chop it down well, here's the like interesting thing. So we have it growing right outside my office here in the ditch along our uh, state highway where we are located. And it's mowed constantly. And I have seen teasel, it will grow and tolerate that mowing. It'll actually flower and set seed at like a six inch height, you know, just, you know, ankle high even. So it tolerates mowing. And so one method that you would think would 
eliminate it does not work, unfortunately. Yeah, and this is a this is a biennial too, so it's going to grow as a rosette that first year. I mean, and it can be multiple years too. Grow as a rosette, and then it will shoot up that seed stock. So if you are mowing, if even in, in turf before it's getting ready to send off that seed stock, you're probably not hitting it, depending on how how your mower is set. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we we can use that biennial life cycle that Ken described to an advantage when we utilize like a, a herbicide treatment. Um, so you can do like a foliar treatment. And if you mow or burn, you can do both of those. Um, teasel does not respond to, to burning. It, it's, it tolerates it just fine, at least that first year basal growth. But it reveals, the mowing or the burning reveals that basal growth, which then you can go, and, go in with like, again, a glyphosate, um, foliar based herbicide. So really low concentration, probably, um, let me look it up to give you the exact concentration here for teasel, but it's usually two to 4%. Yeah. So the resource uh, that we use uh, for often making recommendations is the management of invasive plants and pests in Illinois. We'll leave a link to that. It's a free download uh, in the show notes, uh, but they are recommending a one and a half to 2% um, glyphosate solution for those uh, foliar treatments of that that basal uh, treatment. So that can be done in the in the fall or winter time. Yeah, and then there's your mechanical. So if you've got a small infestation, you pull it out kind of like a dandelion. Mm -hmm. Get your get your dandelion fork out or shovel um, and dig it out. And you know, since this is a biennial, once it flowers, it's done. It's going to die back. So if you can get those seed heads off before it releases the seeds, you know, that would be a way of doing it too. Or once it starts setting out that flower stalk seen some references you go in and cut it um, kind of ground level, get those leaves and stuff cut. And that would, a lot of times will do a good job of just killing it off. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're going to leave the seed heads to remove, make sure you actually remove them before they start releasing all their seed. Don't forget about it because they, they will, yeah. <laughs> the semi will drive by and pull the seeds farther on down the road. Such your alarm clock, calendar right. reminder. <laughs> And, and so teasel is another one of those that is considered, it, maybe if you want to traditionally tease wool, you can order them online. Uh, if you want, because they are kind of interesting looking, they look, would might look neat in like a, like a wreath arrangement or maybe even a floral arrangement. Uh, people can still order these things online, even though it is still illegal to sell the actual plant here in Illinois and plant it. So uh, folks, just keep that in mind. Don't order some of these things online because... It, it can cause a lot of, a lot of problems. All right, I think we've got one more that you can purchase online. So yes, but purple loose strife. So this is what I've never actually encountered in person. I've heard a lot about it and how bad it is, but have you ever seen it I, in person? I definitely have. And uh, my neighbor down the road from me has a uh, purple loose strife in their garden um, as an ornamental and when I drive up from Macomb to Monmouth, there is a stretch of the highway there near Monmouth. It's just all purple loose stripe. And they actually have a lake area there as part of a park, and it's all covered in purple loose stripe. Uh, Ken, I think you and I, before the show, we're talking about, as we read more about this plant, we're like, this is the super powered <laughs> invasive plant. This thing is nuts. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> So I, cause this is going to live in, or can live in, in kind of aquatic areas. I think it even grows in standing water. Mm -hmm. So, so this is from Minnesota DNR. Each mature plant can produce up to 2.7 million seeds annually. And they're Jeez. tiny as a grain of sand. So you can imagine <laughs> those will get everywhere spread by wind and water and wildlife and humans and all that other fun stuff. Uh, seeds can lay dormant for several years in the ground before sprouting. It's not only are there millions of them, they can stick around for a little bit. Uh, and then was on mature plants, roots are extensive and can send out 30 to 50 shoots, creating a dense web. And the pieces of the roots and stem fragments can also produce new plants. So you mm -hmm. chop it up and you don't get everything or dig it out and don't get everything. You've got new plants. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> sounds like a nightmare trying to get rid of this one yeah if you if so one recommendation for mechanical is mowing but if you don't collect everything you've just chopped off that plant and you've sprayed your your uh, mower discharge out one section 
you just created a whole new colony of purple loosestrife because <laughs> those cut stems are going to re root or re sprout. Yeah, no bueno. Yeah, no bueno. We this can be a difficult plant to control. Actually, our um, state forester Chris Evans has shared pictures uh, with us, and has and we have seen how purple loosestrife has invaded some woodlands down in southern Illinois. Uh, and just completely dominated the entire uh, vegetative structure of those areas. And again, another reminder, uh, another pick me up for us who fight invasive species all the time is when we have a like a diminishment in diversity, we lose a lot of wildlife diversity that depends on that that native plant uh, uh, ecology and community. So again, these na these non natives they take over and they they knock out a lot of diversity. And so that is a problem for our wildlife and insect species. And speaking of insects though, Ken, did you know that there are actually biological weevils that have been researched and are now being released to help control purple loose strife? Um, not completely control, but at least sure. maybe 2.7 million seeds, maybe the weevils will feed on, I don't know, knock it down to like a million you know <laughs> see i didn't know i mean, i didn't know specifically about loose strife but yeah i heard of them doing for other plants but you're not specifically loose strife mm -hmm. may have a, a rabbit hole i need to go down now uh yep i have created a rabbit hole for ken we will see you <laughs> next week ken uh <laughs> after you've emerged from this uh, research rabbit hole of weevils and purple loose strife but if you don't want to release uh, weevils into your your uh, purple loose strife, there is a method for controlling that, and that is, of course, again an herbicide method. But we want to make sure that since this is a really popular plant, or it tends to favor wet environments, that you're using an aquatic labeled herbicide. Um, so you could again use glyphosate, but you're going to want to make sure that product is labeled for aquatic ecosystems or to be used in your water bodies. A common brand name. Now we don't often give brand names, but it's very, uh, it's very important that you don't necessarily need to use this, but it has to be labeled this. But is Rodeo, which is basically, it, it's it's glyphosate, but it is labeled for your use near water bodies. So that's just make sure that you're doing that because when it comes to glyphosate, they utilize uh, certain stickers for plants to help them adhere to those plant to plants for control. Well, those stickers in an aquatic ecosystem, you have amphibians and fish and all that things that breathe through their skin and, and insects as well. And they have to eliminate some of those stickers so that it doesn't affect some wildlife. Yeah, so this isn't going to be, if you're doing an aquatic area, this is not the glyphosate you get at the, the box store. Correct. This is going to be looking at a little more specialty store or getting it online. And yeah. with all, oh, go ahead, Ken, go ahead. I was saying, I don't know where you're going, but, um, and there are some, you know, loose stripe that is supposedly, sterile that's being sold that is still not that's still considered invasive because it's still the same species so i've heard that same uh pony show before i saw <laughs> dog song and dance whatever you want to call it uh oh the fruit's sterile we'll give it a couple of years and it's not sterile anymore yes see calorie pear yeah there you go uh, yes let's go back in time last week and you can hear that story um in terms of treatment it does with all of the plants that we've talked about today, uh, with maybe with the exception, well, no, I mean, you can still do this with teasel. A fall treatment is really ideal with the, a lot of the woody plants, especially uh, when it comes to teasel. Again, a fall treatment of that basil, that first year growth. Uh, and then also with purple loosestrife after the first fall, fall frost, um, knocks down a lot of native vegetation, reveals that purple loosestrife so you can more easily target your herbicide applications. And and not only for invasive, I think there's a weed weed management in general fall is a good time because as things are going going dormant, they're they're sending all that stuff back to the roots. It's just it's easier to get those herbicides down into the roots if you're using a systemic mm -hmm. herbicide. So not only your invasives, you're if you're doing lawn weed control or garden, you name it. Falls a so good can time to, to kill plants. Exactly, because they're dying already. <laughs> when I ask kids, like, what's happening to trees in the fall? They're like, they're dying. I'm like, no, <laughs> they're going dormant. <laughs> they're hibernating. They're going to sleep. 
Yeah. So, but that's the usual response of what happens to plants in the fall is they're dying. And um, if they're sending energy and, you know, nutrients to the root system, well, let's give them a little herbicide with it uh, for some of those invasive plants that we love to hate so much. Um, Ken, are there any alternatives to purple loosestrife? Since, I mean, it is a beautiful plant. There, This is something that um, still gets requested from. You can still order this online, once again, to be delivered by the mail carrier to your home. Who knew the mail carrier was uh, complicit in so many illegal things, but they are maybe unknowingly, unknowingly, yes. yes. Hopefully unknowingly. I hope so. Um, yeah, so there's... Well, there's there are some native alternatives out there. So we have something like swamp milkweed. You know, if you want a milkweed that's going to do well in moist conditions or, or wet conditions. Um, Blazing Star is another one if you want that kind of that spiky flower on it, similar to loose strife. Cardinal flower is another one that can take uh, wet conditions, not as long lived. Um, it was a short lived perennial. A lot of people consider a short lived perennial, um, but it will reseed readily. So you know, if you want that sticking around in uh, Joe Pie weed. Eupatorium mm -hmm. would be another one um, that would do well. It got the same, feel kind of that same niche as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. we A lot of the common species that we see out there, the milkweeds, the asters, the goldenrods, you know, they have their upland species and then they have their the kind of slope and then they have their lowland or wetland adapted species. It's, it's interesting all the, how the diversity uh, in a lot of our native plants. So uh, that's definitely, if there's a plant out there that you can think of that's native, more than likely it has a uh, uh, another species of that uh, family that is is adapted to those wet conditions. I'm not going to say all the time, but it happens quite often. Pretty good chance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that sure was a lot of great information about controlling invasive species. So we actually talked about the legally invasive species this week. So uh, as opposed to our species of concern from weeks prior, um, uh, this has been a lot of fun uh, covering these. We got more uh, in the bag for you, so, so please do stay tuned for that. The Good Growing Podcast is a production of University of Illinois Extension, uh, edited this week by, oh, Ken's got editing duties this week. Ah, oops, here we go. Um, well, Ken, thank you very much for being uh, here today to to chat about a, a fun, I would say it's, it's, we'll call it a job security topic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and like you mentioned, there's there's a lot of other stuff out there that we haven't covered. Mm -hmm. um, let me, we'll get to one of these days, but yeah, this, unfortunately, just kind of scratching the surface for uh, invasive plants. I think fortunately nowadays, we're a little more careful about bringing plant material in. Uh, in a lot of cases, there's there's a little more testing involved than oh, there was in the 1700s, 1800s, where there was none. Mm -hmm. um, and a little, a little more careful about recommending um, plants that we're bringing in and, and trialing those first. Yes, the mindset of let's make North America European. Uh, <laughs> I think that it, we've shifted away from that for the most part. So that's great. Yeah. So in a, let's do this again next week, week after next. Oh, sometime. we... We'll, we will do this again next week, probably Garden Bite episode, um, so stay tuned to that. But we have our Halloween episode coming up, um, and so we're going to have to figure out some spectacular way uh, to talk about horticulture because we've already talked about, oh, I already got one. We'll save it for later, though. Uh, me and Ken will have to discuss this one. It'll be great. So listeners, thank you for doing what you do best, that is listening, or if you're watching this on YouTube, watching, and as always, keep on growing.